Welcome to Sobcast the Podcast, where I, Christina Wolfgram, beg the question, what even is mental health? This podcast is created in collaboration with Dive Through, a mental wellness company that actually knows what they're talking about. Hello! Before we get into this episode, I want to present to you the traditional trigger warning. Even though Sobcast the Podcast is about the pursuit of good mental health, we will be talking about not-so-good mental health things like anxiety, depression, and the time in fourth grade when I learned how George Washington died. So, it gives me great pleasure to say welcome to Sobcast the Podcast. I'm Christina Wolfgram. It's so nice to meet you, and if you've been here. Thank you so much. I'm really, like, really excited for this next chapter of Sobcast. I am so, like, beyond happy to be working with Dive Through. If you haven't checked out their mental health resources, I, I, I can't recommend them enough. Um, They have an app that's like a journaling app. I think it's really great for people who want to express themselves on their phone, like if they don't like writing in a journal. And their website is just like a treasure chest full of knowledge. (laughs) Like any question you've ever had about your brain, they have an amazing expert answering your questions and it's really accessible which i like it's like it's it's not like when you look something up on webmd and it's like medical jargon that's just all scary it's it's fun it's written like your best friend is talking to you about your brain which i really appreciate it's very soothing um and if you haven't checked out their other mental health podcast you should definitely do that too because they're awesome and I can't believe I get to be part of their team. It's it's a dream come true. A dream come true. And I'm so excited that my upper lip is sweating. Okay. <laughs> so if you hear some upper lip sweat, that's what's going on. I'm just excited. I'm excited to be here. Um where I'm at now, I recently moved to Portland. Um, I, my home, my home is Los Angeles, California, Uh, but during the pandemic, I lived in New Mexico with my then boyfriend's family, and um, he recently broke up with me. We'd been together for over eight years, so I'm a grieving. I'm grieving. I'm really proud of myself that I can say that sentence without bursting into tears. I think that's like huge growth and we should celebrate that. So what's like the opposite of a moment of silence? Like a round of applause, please. If if you have a round of applause to spare, uh, I think we should celebrate the fact that I'm not crying thinking about that. It's the little things. Um, My cat mister is currently under my desk he is the most beautiful sweet furry angel and i think he could sense how excited i was to do this because 99 percent of the time he doesn't give one little kitty poop what i'm doing and so the fact that he's under my desk and hanging out with us is pretty major i will not be taking that for granted So, Sobcast is back. I thought this episode, uh, I could just talk about my mental health journey so far so that we can move forward on that journey together. Friendship. This is happening on a really interesting day, actually, because (laughs) this morning... I had therapy at 10 a.m., as I do twice a week. I've been going twice a week since the breakup, 
and it's been really, really, really helpful. My therapist is one of my favorite people on this planet. She is smart. She is so funny. She uh, can do astrology and she's into tarot, which you know I love. She um, used to be an artist. She's lived like 10 lives and I don't know. She's just so cool. She's like mystical. And she informed me that she can no longer see me as a patient. I'm fine. I'm fine. (laughs) Um, so next week is going to be our last session together. Oh, and it's not because she doesn't like me. <laughs> I just want to I, I want to make that clear. Um she is in New Mexico where I've been living and now that I'm living in Portland, you know, the laws are weird. The laws are so weird. Even though we have never met in person, we have only talked online. The laws The powers that be say that we can't see each other anymore. It's basically Romeo and Juliet, except we're both going to be okay. We're both very glamorous and fabulous, (laughs) and we're going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. But what this means is that I'm going to have to find a new therapist. And if you've ever looked for a therapist, you know it's like the weirdest kind of dating because you basically go on like a therapist like Tinder and look through everybody's profiles and you say, oh wow, that person looks kind of nice. Or, oh, I like that person's blazer. I should tell them about all my trauma. That's, you know, I think I trust them enough to do that. (laughs) And then you call their office. And they may or may not be taking new patients. And if they are, you make an appointment for like two weeks from now. And you spend all of those days wondering how far you're going to go. Like, how much are you going to tell them? Are you going to start with your childhood or should you start with the recent stuff or should you just bring a bunch of pictures of your cat and start there and there's the worry like okay I just told this person all of my deep dark secrets do I really want to continue with them should I give them more of a chance It's making my heart race. (laughs) My pulse is like skyrocketing. Um, But um, I thought that this could be a test run. Maybe you could help me through it. (laughs) Thank you for being here with me. Um, I guess I should start with the fact that I have been diagnosed with depression and generalized anxiety disorder. When I look back on my life, I know that for sure I've been experiencing both of those things ever since I was a little kid, but I only got officially diagnosed. Oh my gosh, time is so weird. I think it's been about three years because I got diagnosed and then I decided to try just therapy. I was really nervous to go on medication. We should definitely talk about that more, but the basic gist is that it seemed like a huge commitment and I wasn't sure how was it going to affect me. I am... (laughs) 
I'm very creative, so I was worried it was going to dampen my creative brain and, um, and that I would have to take it for the rest of my life. And so I did that for about a, a year and it, I wasn't, it's not that I wasn't feeling better. Mm, no, it wasn't that I, I just, I just was not feeling good. <laughs> So I started taking Lexapro and I think that really helped my anxiety. And then about a year later, I started on Wellbutrin, which I think has really helped my depression. Um, I still experience both that anxiety and depression, but um, I had a boyfriend in college who one time explained it like this. He was like, most people experience emotions like happiness and sadness, but you experience like happiness all the way up here, like dramatically above a lot of people's threshold, and you experience sadness like way down here, like way below a lot of other people's threshold. And I think what medication has done for me is that it's just kind of evened that out a little bit. I think I don't experience as low of lows. And even if I do kind of fall down there, I can see the light, if that makes sense. It doesn't feel like it's going to be forever anymore, which is huge because that can be the scariest thing about feeling like shit is that you forget you forget that it can get better and that it will get better. So cheers to Lexapro and Wellbutrin and whoever invented them. Thank you for that. Um, 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 should I talk about my childhood? Like, I guess, right? I was born crying (laughs) and I've been crying ever since. (laughs) Um, I was such an emotional child. When I think about little baby Christina, I I just want to give her a big hug. Um, I loved dance. I took dance classes. I was a little tap dancer. And... I loved going to class, but then before every performance, I would, like, cry the whole time backstage. And then right before we went on, I would compose myself and get through the the number and then come backstage and cry with relief. And I was, like, four. <laughs> uh, when I went to kindergarten, oh, man, I cried every morning during the Pledge of Allegiance. Ugh. Poor kid. I think I was just nervous about the, uh, I think I was just nervous about the fact that I never knew what was going to happen. I didn't know. That's the generalized part of generalized anxiety. It's just like the, I don't know. In general, they're just like, I don't know. And that's, that's very, that, that makes my chest tight. That makes me not be able to breathe. That makes me cry during the Pledge of Allegiance, every morning. (laughs) And to give my baby self credit, I did usually pull myself together, and I actually loved school when I wasn't a nervous wreck about it. I loved learning. I loved reading. I definitely used books as an escape, Uh, and I'm so thankful for books like Amber Brown and The Secret Garden and... Um, the, the boxcar children, anyone, anyone, how about the magic tree house? That, those books, oh my gosh, they're so, I should read those again, actually. Should we do an episode just about books we liked as kids? Because when I look, (laughs) I had friends at school, but they didn't get me like how, the kids in books got me like they didn't understand and they weren't as funny and smart 
Um, no offense to my friends from kindergarten, but yeah, I, uh, I was anxious through elementary school. Um, when I was in third grade, my mom had a really mysterious illness and I say mysterious because she went to a lot of doctor's appointments and, you know, didn't get a diagnosis and so didn't have a way to make herself feel better. And there was a lot of Gatorade in the house because she'd get dehydrated. And to this day, like just the smell of Gatorade I hate it so much. It makes me want to yak. Like I just, it immediately brings me back to just being like crazy worried about losing everything, about going to school and coming home and like not having a mom or just something bad happening that would be out of my control. And I'm so grateful for the tools I've learned over the years because now I have accepted that I don't have control of some things. Okay, well, some days I've accepted that I don't have control over some things. But as a kid, I thought it was my responsibility somehow to save her, to to be there. Like, as if I could do anything. I was nine. Um... Eventually, I made myself really sick. I think I gave myself an ulcer at one point. I had to go to the hospital because I wasn't, like, eating or drinking. I mean, so rude. My parents were going through so much. And to their credit, they were the most amazing. Like, they they were my first therapist, to be honest. Um, they let me talk about my feelings they, I don't, yeah, I don't know how they did it. I, I have a really wonderful memory of, um, something my mom set up where every Monday me and my three siblings, I'm the oldest of four. So it wasn't just my feelings they were dealing with. It was four kids worth of problems. (laughs) Um, but my mom every Monday would set up a tea party for us when we'd come home from school And we would drink tea out of, like, legit teacups, like, fancy teacups, like, the kind that are usually, like, behind glass, like, the kind you don't get to touch when you're a kid. And, I mean, I don't have anything like that now. It was so fancy. And she had us each go around and talk about what we were worried about or what we were excited about. And that ability to talk about what was going on in my head has saved me again and again and again. So huge shout out to my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, around this time, I started faking illnesses to not go to school. And, uh, It's interesting looking back at it as an adult. I mean, it was so long ago now. I thought I was faking. I thought that I was saying, like, I really don't feel good. And I was lying. Like, I had everyone fooled, like, all the adults in my life. But I think I really didn't feel good. (laughs) I think that... I was having stomach aches and I was, I mean, tense as a little kid. I mean, just holding back tears for like a full school day (laughs) takes a lot of energy. And um, I have a really specific memory of getting ready to go on a field trip and all of the kids in my class were so into field trips. They were so excited. And we were going to go to Mount Vernon. I grew up right outside of Washington, D.C. And so my teacher gave us a lesson on like what we were going to see at Mount Vernon. And it was like 
wow, you will see George Washington's toilets. I mean, they're filled in now, but that's where he sat. By the way, they were just like holes in wood. Like that's, okay, that's not important. It's like important and not important. Uh, You know, we learned about the stupid wooden teeth. That's like not even real. Anyway, don't look that up. No, look it up. It's important. Actually, it's all disturbing. But um, the thing that my fragile little brain just globbed onto was how George Washington died. And I'm about to talk about that right now. So if hearing about death and weird medical stuff is not your thing, maybe fast forward like two minutes. Um, as I remember it, George Washington got sick with like something very curable, like a cold or like pneumonia or something. He got a little chicken pox. I don't know. And the doctor came over to his house and he was like, I know um, what to do. I will put leeches on your body and they will suck out the germs and your blood, but germs. And um, the doctor, oh God, the doctor didn't um, calculate how much blood George Washington could lose. And so George Washington bled to death. And my teacher was like, and we'll get to see his bed where he died. In his bedroom where he died. And in my head, I was like, if I go into that room, I'm going to die. I cannot. Absolutely not. No, no. And I worried about it for like two weeks. And the morning of the field trip, I think I had stayed up like all night just fretting and trying to figure out a way to get out of it. And so I just told my mom I had strep. (laughs) And my mom used to be a nurse, so I think she probably knew that I didn't just have strep. Um, But I was so anxious about going there that I was sick. Um, around that time, I went to my first real therapist, and she was a magical lady who had a magical basement full of crafts that you could do, so I made little clay animals, and I made necklaces with, she had, like, the giant box of beads, you know what I mean? Like, you could buy, like, at Michael's, I'm sure you could buy, like, a little, little pots of be- beans. <laughs> little beans of beads, jewelry beads. You can, you know, but she had, like, a, she had, like, a suitcase of beads. It was, like, infinite beads. You could, like, make necklace after necklace, and it, you couldn't make a dent in the beads. Like, you didn't, there was no scarcity. Like, it was amazing. And I don't remember what we talked about, but I really, I remember making the necklaces for my mom and that summer between fourth and fifth grade I also got cats got two cats they were two black and white cats and I give them full credit for helping me cope They gave me something to focus on and to look forward to coming home to. I don't, I don't fully understand how it happened, but by the time I got to fifth grade, I just felt so much better. Like I felt stronger and way less panicky. Um, I didn't feel the urge to cry all the time. Um, Another thing that happened uh, especially in fourth grade was that I would get really attached to objects. I would be like, okay, this lip smackers is a lucky lip smackers. I don't know. Like I just, I, I'm positive this grape lip smackers is what is holding the threads of the universe together. So I need it in my pocket at all times. 
And if I didn't have it in my pocket, I was so like vibrating with anxiety. I remember I had a keychain. It was a keychain of a little cross that I got at church. Nothing to do with religion in my mind. I just was so attached to this little keychain and I lost it on an airplane. And bless my mom, she called United Airlines and was like, hi, (laughs) I know you're busy, but my nine-year-old lost a maybe one-inch keychain. If you could just check on the airplane, if it's there, thank you. (laughs) And obviously they did not uh, call back, but fifth grade, I didn't need those special little objects. I, yeah, I don't know. I I felt so much better. And um, a year or two later, I made one of the most important friendships of my life. Uh, (laughs) uh, I had a friend who introduced me to a book series. I hope you've heard of it. It's the Georgia Nicholson series that starts with Angus thongs and full frontal snogging. It's basically the diary of a hilarious British teenager who is really worried about boys and her friends and she has like her own version of you know the bases like of like kissing and and uh, I don't know reading what felt like a friend writing in a journal really empowered me to start journaling and I got to a point where I was writing like every night and my friend was incredible because she was also writing and we would write for each other we would like switch notebooks and read each other's journals I have never had that kind of trust with anyone else in my life ever again. I would never let anyone read my journals, ever. In fact, I've told all my loved ones that when I die, please put all my journals in a fire and roast some marshmallows. Like, enjoy it. But don't read them. Please, please. That time of writing with my friend and reading those books and discovering how to put words to my feelings was the most important thing ever, ever, (laughs) because that has been my best and most constant coping mechanism has been journaling, has been writing, has been figuring out how to explain my emotions. And sometimes that means really bad metaphors. But you got to do what you got to do. And it, you know, my upper lip is sweating all over again (laughs) with emotion. So that's honestly how I got here. Through the years, I've had columns in the school newspaper. I have started so many blogs, so many blogs, where I just wrote about, you know, what I had for lunch, a bookstore that I went to, how I feel about shoes, and now I get to talk to you. And since that time, that very important time, I have had one constant question, which is, what? (laughs) Huh? (laughs) What? (laughs) And only in adulthood did I realize that really what I was questioning is, why do I feel this way? And how does everyone else feel? Because it seems like no one else is struggling as much as me. And that is 
what we are going to explore together on Soundcast the podcast. What are we feeling and why are we feeling this and do we have to and how and am I weird? Is this, is this okay? I think, um, I have figured out that mental health is not about being happy. It's not about finding a peace that you can have all the time. It's not, it's not just some positive emotion. It is a daily practice. It doesn't have an end point. So there's infinite things that we can explore. What makes us feel less bad? Or if we're feeling bad, how do we use those feelings to grow, to get stronger? I've heard in the past few years, mental health being compared to physical health a lot. And that means being consistent with the workouts of your mind. Sometimes that means lifting really heavy emotional things. And sometimes that means taking rest days because otherwise you will just be so exhausted that you can't go on and you can't lift the heavy things anymore. So, what are the things? What are the, what? Huh? (laughs) This is a little bit of a tangent, but like I said, I am in a stage of just intense grief. I, uh... (laughs) The past year of the pandemic and and quarantine, I think all of us felt a lot of grief because we lost so much. We lost plans and we lost a lot of the tools that we usually use to cope. We lost time with our friends and family and, and a lot of the things that we relied on to feel less bad, to help us lift those heavy things. And, um, and now I am grieving this relationship and the grief sometimes feels like my brain is blowing out a trick candle and my brain will like blow out the candle of feeling like crap and I'll be so excited to like cut into the cake of life and get get moving on and then the candle will just like come back on and I'll have to find the breath to blow it out again and sometimes uh that just makes my brain shut down like literally while I'm talking And that's especially frustrating when I want to be expressing myself. So please forgive me for any, uh, any uhs and, and stopping and starting. I want to show you that that's normal and I, I want to make it normal, a normal, normal, normal. I, I want you to feel less bad about it if that's ever happened to you and also you know recognize it if one of your friends one of your loved ones is having kind of brain farts like that it might be an indication that they're just feeling a lot that they're just grieving something maybe something they don't even know how to wrap their brain around like something they can't even explain What else would I tell a therapist that I'm just meeting? Oh, yeah. Um, um, when was this? Like, I think 2017, 18? 
I don't remember. Time doesn't exist. I think actually it was like 2016. I started working for a company called Hello Giggles and uh, it was Zoe Deschanel's like women's website and um, I started out by blogging for them. I freaking I loved their voice. I loved how they were talking to women because they were expressing like news and important stuff that people should know about, but they were doing it in a way that one, didn't talk to women like they were stupid, which is huge. And two, like being funny and having levity just in daily news is hard and wonderful. So writing for them was so great. It felt the most like writing in those journals in seventh grade that I had ever felt. And um, eventually I was so lucky. Like it was right around the time BuzzFeed videos were really big. You know what I'm talking about? Like, uh, like if you were a cat or like, like, uh, if, if your period was a person, like things like that. And I noticed that BuzzFeed was making a lot of videos for women about very specifically women experiences, but they were trying to appeal to everyone, if that makes sense. They were very general and, I mean, obviously brilliant, brilliant. They there was a reason they were getting quadrillions of views and that the site blew up like it did. But um, I wanted to make videos like that for Hello Giggles and I wanted it to be a little bit more honest. Not honest. Um, graphic? <laughs> I think graphic is the word I'm looking for, honestly. Like, I think the the very first video that I made for them was about getting your period and my favorite part was that I sneezed and you know that feeling of like when you're wearing a pad and and you sneeze and it just you're worried that like snot came out your nose but also like blood came out your vagina you know what I'm talking about and I mean, that video was the first video I ever made that got a million views, and that's crazy still to this day. That is so crazy, and um, so I made videos for that company for, I want to say, like, two years. Like I said, like, time doesn't make any sense to me anymore, and the company that I started at was a startup. It was super small. There were, like... I think there were like five people on staff or something when I when I got there and they then sold to Time Inc. And then it was part of this big, you know, big corporation and they hired so many like the best people. They hired people who are still just like a huge part of my life and I eventually put too much pressure on myself Um, and we can definitely get into that in another episode, but, um, somehow I created this environment in my mind, um, that I just was never doing enough, even though some of my videos had like 60 million views. What? What? What the heck? That's insane. That's so, that is so bonkers. Um, oof. Um, but eventually the, the site got sold again, or no, I guess the company got sold to another company and the atmosphere got really, really corporate, which I think, you know, corporations are well-oiled machines and I am not oiled at all. (laughs) I was like 
clogging up the machine with with my emotions and my problems and um my just just inability to adapt to those changes so um in 2019 I left that felt like a breakup because it was like, wow, we still love each other, but I cannot be here for you. I don't have the strength to like do what you need me to do, basically. And um, then I spent, I think, maybe like a month in bed being really sad. This is actually really, this is, um, I think in October of that year, I went on a trip to go to my friend's wedding. Actually, it was the friend from seventh grade, my bestest friend who changed my life. And I took Spirit Airlines like a dum-dum. That was the last time I ever took Spirit Airlines. And they lost all of my luggage. And because I was going to a wedding, (laughs) they lost like all my nicest clothes and all my nicest makeup and my skincare. And I spent months fighting them to pay for what they lost. And I think like the day after I put in my notice at Hello Giggles, I got, I got that money and it was enough money to like live for a month, basically. So even though I was like, I I'm gonna leave this job and I'm just gonna make my own YouTube channel. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be so creative. I'm gonna make my own empire because I'm just meh, meh, meh. Instead, I spent, I think, that entire month in bed. And it was rough, but I got through it, obviously. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Ah, yeah, these are things I would tell a therapist. Is this TMI? I don't even know anymore. I don't know anymore. Telling you all of this, I hope maybe that you're having ideas for things that you would want to hear future episodes about. Because I'm happy to talk about all of this. And I think I'm just like skimming the surface of a lot of of a lot of stuff. We are like ice skating together over, we're like ice skating together on like really thin ice over like an extremely deep lake. I'm so sorry. That's a terrifying image. <laughs> oh, but um, I'm now I'm living in Portland and I'm here in this apartment and I'm living here with Mr. The Cat. He is currently asleep on his back. I can see his white belly. And that makes me really, really happy. <laughs> really, really happy. And I hope that together we can continue on this journey of just finding out like not only like what is mental health, but like how can we have that? How can we do the thing? How can we slice through all the bullshit and get to... How can... (laughs) If mental health is a Tootsie Roll pop, like, how many licks does it take to get to the center? And is the Tootsie Roll in the middle, like, even worth getting to? You know what I'm saying? Or is it just some candy that's going to get, like, stuck in our teeth and we're going to be like, oh, God, I can, like, feel the cavities forming. This is terrible right? (laughs) I think that this is the point where we should wrap up our first uh, therapy session here. Um, I will make sure to pay my copay on the way out. (laughs) I'm going to say this maybe a thousand more times, but I'm just so grateful that you're here and that I get to hang out with you, whether you're, we're in your car or if you're listening to this while you work or on a walk or while you're trying to take a nap 
or while you're crying or whether you're on the toilet or in a in your bath or making dinner like wow I get to spend time with you that's that's such an honor so thank you so much and I will see you next time right yay thank you so much for hanging out with me today it would super help if you subscribed left a review call your grandma tell her to listen and if you want more sobcast the podcast follow us on instagram all right see you next week love you bye